go for it. Okay, Brenner, you can do it. All right, should I wait for the participant no, number two? You're good. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Brenner Fassell. I'm the vice president of the National Institute of Military Justice. And today, the National Institute of Military Justice will be partnering with the Center on National Security at Fordham Law School to discuss the prospects for the closure of Guantanamo uh, prison and the ending of the military commissions. Uh, I think we've been talking about this issue since Barack Obama's first campaign, but in the last few months, uh, it seems like the talk is getting more serious. So we're going to talk with some experts today about more serious prospects for closure um, in the next year. Uh, I'm just delighted to turn over the panel to the moderator today, which is Dr. Karen Greenberg, Director of the Center on National Security at Fordham Law. Dr. Greenberg announced this morning <clears throat> that she will be uh, publishing a book on the war on terror and also on the Trump presidency out August 21st, uh, 24th, rather, Princeton University Press, quote, subtle tools, the dismantling of American democracy from the war on terror to Donald Trump, uh, will be published later this year by Dr. Greenberg. Uh, turning it over to you, Dr. Greenberg. Thank you so much, Brenner, and um, thank you to the National Institute of Military Justice for conceiving of this panel, putting it together, and inviting us all. I am extremely excited to be talking about how to close Guantanamo Bay detention facility. I feel like at least with Carol Rosenberg, uh, I've been having this conversation repeatedly. Um, so let's get to it. Let me introduce our panel panelists and see where we can get today. Carol Rosenberg is a senior reporter for the New York Times. She's been reporting on Guantanamo Bay prison uh, since 2002, first for the Miami Herald, then starting in 2019, she joined the New York Times to continue and actually expand her coverage. Prior to that, she was the Miami Herald's Middle East correspondent. She has received the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award for her Guantanamo coverage, as well as the ABA Silver Gavel Award and other honors. She was also part of the Herald team that won the Pulitzer Prize for breaking news coverage in 2001. Our next guest today is Benjamin Farley, a trial attorney and law of war counsel at the U.S. Department of Defense Military Commission's Defense Organization. He's assigned to the team representing Amara Baluchi, one of the five co-defendants in the 9-11 conspiracy case. From 2013 to 2017, he served as senior advisor to the special envoy for Guantanamo, Guantanamo closure at the US Department of State. A 2012 presidential management fellow, Mr. Farley received a JD from Emory School of Law. So we have a wonderful uh, set of panelists today to talk about this. And I wanna start with Carol and refer to my original thought uh, starting out here, which is that we've had this conversation over and over and over again about closing Guantanamo, reducing the size of Guantanamo, setting out a plan for closing Guantanamo. I'm curious to know how you feel now that there seems to be some intentionality coming out of the new administration across the executive where there have been indicators that yes, they wanna close it, they're just not sure how. Do you feel that we're just on repeat and in a Mobius loop of sorts? Or do you really think that maybe we've, we've turned the page and that this is a, a, a realistic possibility in ways it hasn't been in the past. Carol, you're muted. Unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I think that it, you know, on, on some sense it's realistic in that there's only 40 detainees down there as opposed to the 240 plus that uh, President Obama inherited when he made the vow to close it. But we learned from President Obama, hate to be the spoiler here, that closing Guantanamo meant moving Guantanamo, picking up a certain number of those detainees, taking them from that base and putting them in the United States under some sort of uh, detention authority, if, if not by finding ways to convict them. So um, closing Guantanamo, sure, there could be a day when there are no war on terror detainees on that base. And I imagine we're gonna take this apart in pieces that the Biden administration will try to reduce that population dramatically. But 
as I think you know, there's somebody who's been convicted of war crimes and is serving a life sentence. And unless somebody, you know, I guess grants him clemency or he wins the reversal on his conviction, he's appealing. Um, Guantanamo detention lasts as long as a man named Ali Hamza Balul, who I think is in his 50s. Um, so sure, the Biden administration could, if it finds the political will and support, pick up some of those people and bring them to the United States. But the notion that people have, probably not your audience, because they're, they're, they've, they've thought about this, the notion that somebody's going to open up the cell doors and they're all going to walk out and get on flights and head out is just not possible. Um, many years ago, before the 9-11, uh, before the high value detainees were brought from the black sites, um, I, I had some conversations with a number of, of, of generals who were uncomfortable with the idea of this forever detention, not exactly as POWs. And um, very early on, the thought was, well, they could load them up on cargo planes, fly to Bagram Air Base, and set them free into Afghanistan. That is no longer possible. We are leaving, you know, we are ceding authority or, or a relationship. We're ceding a presence in Afghanistan. And it would, I mean, long ago it became impossible once the CIA dropped prisoners off there. But, but the idea that we can just let people go was lo is long ago been dispensed with. So closed, yes, but not really. We're going to get into some of the details of the different sort of categories of individuals and the and the problems of, of, of release or transfer or whatever for each. But just I wanted to ask you a question of those 40, um, six have been cleared for release, I think. Um, and so uh, it just, you know, um, plans have to be put in place for that to happen, I guess, and which requires some degree of negotiation. But of the remaining ones, how many do you think um, are potentially clearable for release through the PRB? I guess the question is, um, first of all, we would all be scolded for using the term release because yes. what they talk about is transfer. So I, quest, I guess the question is what kind of negotiations can be carried out by US officials, diplomats for what they would consider to be a safe and comfortable transfer, which is really to the custody in some instances of other countries. Um, there are people there that uh, who are not, it cannot be charged with crimes, who uh, the intelligence apparatus considers too dangerous to release. So, so in, I would say in the coming year, there'll be a, a, a real, hopefully meaningful analysis of what that means and, and, and why somebody who's been held for 20 years or 18 years ha, um, is too dangerous to release. And if they change the definition of that um, and recognize that there's probably a time limit on um, their dangerousness, that they've aged out of the movement, they've aged out of being you know, a soldier or a foot soldier, or they genuinely want to move on with their lives, if they can figure out an analysis, I would say that many of the prisoners who aren't charged could get a, a good strong look about where they might be transferred. Um, I also think, you know, there was once an idea that these people would be sent to other countries for trial. I, you know, time seems to have run out on a lot of these trials, right? We picked them up. But we, these men all arrived in Guantanamo by 2008. Um, and if there was any meaningful evidence on them, it's probably gone quite stale. Yeah, I mean, I think that the the and 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 we often hear the evidence of the problem, whether it's for you know the issue of transferring these to federal court, which we'll get to later in the discussion, perhaps, or just within the military commissions themselves. So sort of at a paralysis. Okay, let me turn to Ben for a similar kind of overview, and I want to read something that you wrote last fall, contemplating um, emptying Guant or closing Guantanamo uh, in just security. Indeed, the reality is that Biden's administration can accomplish 75% of the closure just simply by restoring, with slight modification, the successful Gitmo closure policy process developed during the Obama administration. Do you still stand by that? And could you just elaborate on it a little bit? Uh, sure. And uh, and first of all, let me say thank you to, uh, to Brenner and the National Institute of Military Justice and to you, Karen, and the Center for National Security at Fordham for hosting this. Uh, and I also have to say that 
Uh, I am a employee of the Department of Defense, so the opinions I express today are mine alone, and they do not represent the views of the Department of Defense or the U.S. government. Um, but to, to actually answer your question, I do stand by that. Um, I think that the, you know, when I wrote that last fall, I, um, I sort of divided the population of Guantanamo into, uh, into roughly two buckets. One, the, the folks that are um, the detainees who are in some part of the military commissions or some form of military commissions proceedings, um, which would be now 12, given the, uh, um, the referred charges for the, the Malaysians, um, and, and then everybody else. So, it's you know we I, we spend a lot of time talking about the PRB and and the sort of subcategories of detainees down there the the ones who are approved for transfer and those who are you know not approved for transfer and and those who are in um, in some prosecution mode uh, but the reality is that the PRB is a, a discretionary process right it, it has um, it doesn't result in any sort of change in legal status. Uh, the view of the Obama administration and presumably the Trump administration as well was that uh, anyone who was approved for transfer um, was still inherently detainable under the laws of war uh, and, and transfer was merely a, um, a threat assessment decision. So, um, you know, one way to solve the problem, um, you know, to move towards Guantanamo closing the detention facility would be to uh, emphasize the PRBs. But President Biden is, you know, fundamentally can do whatever he wants, right? Like he can transfer these folks irrespective of their designation. Um, you know, in that piece, I argued that, you know, utilizing the infrastructure, the policy infrastructure that's already in place is probably the best way to go about uh, pursuing the goal of getting closure. Um, but he's certainly not bound by PRB determinations. Um, putting aside the sort of nitty gritty of the policy process, I'm I'm reasonably hopeful, and I think uh, I probably part ways with Carol uh, to some extent here, that President Biden will be able to uh, close Guantanamo, um, you know, with a sort of caveat of there's some fuzziness around what closure actually means, uh, depending on who you talk to. Uh, just based on his, you know, his personal commitment to closing the facility, I think, uh, Karen, in a piece you wrote earlier this week, you, you know, noted that he had been in favor of closing the detention facility since 2005. Um, you know, the vice president's office was involved in efforts to close the detention facility during the Obama administration. Uh, President, Biden, uh, President Biden has committed to closing it. Uh, senior officials within the administration already have indicated that it will be closed, that it's the goal to close the facility. And it's, you know, it's a plank in the Democratic Party platform. Um, so all that seems to indicate that President Biden is sincere about closing the detention facility. And, you know, over the course of the last hundred days or so, I think we've got pretty good evidence that uh, President Biden uh, accomplishes things that he sets out to do, that he's sincere about doing. Um, I like the hopeful, the hopeful tone of that. So I want to talk to talk about military commissions because it's sort of, you know, you talk about these 12 cases, the military commissions have been, I would say, gone backwards, uh, if, if, if there's any direction on them um, for, for their entire uh, lifespan. Um, and so do you really see the military commissions be, being able to process these cases in a timely and um, legitimate fashion um, in a way that can close Guantanamo? Or do you see certain changes being made either in the um, ability to plea, the death penalty taken off the table, or shall I raise something that I know gets shut down almost as it started, or in a return to Article Three courts? Where do you see the military commissions headed as you've seen it from the inside? So, I mean, I, I don't think that it's a controversial position at this point to note that the military commissions have failed. Um, I mean, certainly the, their original goal of uh, generating rough and expeditious justice has been belied by the sheer passage of time. Um, that said, there are active cases in the military commissions. There are rules of procedure, flawed as they are, and um, those procedure, or those regulations allow for um, plea agreements. And it seems to me like if the Biden administration were to ask me what to do to resolve the um, existing military commissions proceedings, I would suggest that um, they enter into plea negotiations immediately with uh, defense counsel for those cases um, to begin moving those cases towards resolution. Um, it, 
in my view, um, art, you know, obviously Article Three courts exist and they're available, um, uh, but it seems to me that going an Article Three route would actually um, inject additional delay uh, into an already um, horrifically delayed um, uh, uh, quest. I don't, I don't know. I, I've lost my word, but uh, uh, a process that's taken way too long already. Um, you know, you, you'd have to indict folks. There'd have to be U.S. attorneys involved. Um, you know, there are jurisdictional questions. There are lots of things that would need to get answered in order to go the Article Three route that um, have already been resolved to some extent by the, the existence of the military commissions. Not to mention the fact that Congress would have to withdraw the ban on detainees coming to the United States for that to happen. Uh, Carol, do, do, do you think that's a, a do, you, do you feel the same way about the military commissions and prospects that, that, that a plea deal, plea deals um, are possible? Oh, I think there's great interest in plea deals, but on behalf of the, anyone who's representing anyone in a death case, I guess the question is, is whether the, they, they would be willing to and are capable of abandoning their challenges to the legitimacy of military commissions if they plead guilty. Um, you know, the, the, the state of play is to argue that, again, the military commissions aren't legitimate and therefore would a guilty plea be the end of the story or the next phase of court uh, challenges over these men's detention? Um, and the other thing is you sort of mentioned it, the, the gorilla in the room is national domestic politics. Maybe I'm getting to it too soon, but national domestic politics and the absolutely irresistible allure to cast anyone who might release or settle a case as being soft on terror. Um, it's glib, there's a long argument and a big discussion on it, but that's what happens with Guantanamo. You know, um, if you don't move fast, if you move incrementally, if you allow for uh, the national discussion to occur on a very superficial level, nearly anything you do lands towards closure, you know, lands in the bucket of, oh, you're, you're soft on terror and you're endangering the national security of the United States. Um, the president has, I would think, has to figure out a way to sell this as well. You know, the national security necessity of, of, of leaving Guantanamo detention um, to, to, the, to, you know, to the political world who are going to be, you know, the, the one thing is he's doing everything alone. He's decided to go these things alone. This is a, th this is something that I can foresee looming over the midterm elections uh, very soon. So, you know, the, there's the practicalness, there, there are formulas for getting out of there, but national politics does intrude. Um, and so part of what you're suggesting is that one of the lessons from the Obama administration is the quicker the better, um, because, you know, it was sort of in those early months where the intention to close it sort of evaporated almost by his first national security speech. Is that part of what you're suggesting or am I misreading that? I recall being at the Department of Justice, I'm gonna get the year wrong, when um, Eric Holder, Attorney General Eric Holder announced that the 9-11 um, defendants were going to be tried in federal court in New York City, um, you know, just blocks from ground zero and uh, expecting the next sentence coming out of his mouth to be, and they have been already relocated to detention in New York City. The, uh, but in fact, the ambition to do this big thing in New York City became a political football and, and, and sort of one of the very first versions of this argument that doing anything but indefinite detention with this military commissions at Guantanamo is a threat to national security. So I think the lesson learned is, we've had this conversation, move quickly and secret, secretly and don't allow people to discuss what you're doing if you want to achieve that goal, right? That's interesting. So maybe this, this is what this interagency group is talking about that we've been told is meeting. Um, ben, I want to I want to turn a little bit to the courts and how they're handling a number of cases that are coming up. And today's New York Times, Linda Greenhouse had an op-ed, basically, you know, giving up on the Supreme Court, noting how Boumediene really didn't have the legs that they expected it to have in terms of habeas. 
um, and pointing to the Alhella case. And I just wondered where you see the role. Let's start with the Supreme Court. Do you agree with Linda Greenhouse on that? Um, and do you really think this is very much in the political realm? Um, it's kind of following on Carol's comments right now. Um, and I just want your, your thoughts on, on where this is headed Supreme Court wise or, or not headed. So um, I think it's a great question. And I, uh, I, um, I found uh, Linda Greenhouse's piece in the Times uh, this morning to be quite insightful and, and um, um, probably right on the money. I mean, I, I don't think that there's any debate really that uh, the, the sort of promise of Bemidian and the uh, and the various the preceding Guantanamo cases um, from the middle of the 2000s has been whittled away by the DC Circuit, uh, you know, uh, and and left to be you know Gimbo habeas is almost a dead letter at this point. Um, the you know, Linda would know much better than me about reading tea leaves in terms of um, arrangements of judges and 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 you know who's on what on bank panel and and how that you know what that augurs for an outcome at the D.C. Circuit with respect to Al Hella's case. But um, just but, yeah, to point out that the case talks about the right of the uh, detainees to have, to uh, due process, which right. is actually you know in in some circles, civil liberty circles, and elsewhere, it's sort of like you're like a deer in the head, like like what they don't have due process. So it's actually a, a particularly important case to this conversation, just to fill in that the full panel is going to hear. Yeah, right. And, and and to be candid, it's it's like it is probably more important to people like my client who have you know active you know, criminal proceedings in a military tribunal at Guantanamo than to many other folks at Guantanamo. Um, so, you know, it's an important case and, you know, we're certainly watching it, but it's, um, it, with respect to its impact on Guantanamo closure, I, I'm not sure that the Supreme Court is going to, you know, play that heavily in, um, in Gitmo closure in general, um, particularly because the court has shown a, a pretty serious unwillingness to resolve any of the other questions that have come up in the last almost 13 years since Bomidian was handed down. Um, on, on the political point, I think that, you know, Carol makes a, a really excellent point. Um, and and I, I would just say that, you know, President Biden lived through the, the experiences she described as vice president. And I think that you know, one way we can sort of look at the quiescence, the public quiescence around Guantanamo over the last, you know, almost four months is the Obama, or excuse me, the Biden administration is not doing enough or moving slowly. Um, that And that might be correct. Another way to look at this is that they've learned the lessons of the Obama administration and that they are moving um, with appropriate deliberation and seriousness, but doing so in a non-public way. Uh, and hopefully, they are, you know, getting their ducks in a row quietly so that they can present decisions as a fait accompli and not as this sort of opening salvo of a public debate that, you know, as Carol rightly points out, will immediately become toxic because the politics around Guantanamo are horrendous. Um, that's my hope. And I, I suppose we will see in the next couple of months, at least according to uh, Secretary of State Blinken, um, whether uh, Carol's pessimism is correct, or you know, my sort of faint hope is uh, uh, is the right way to read this uh, public quiescence. Carol, I want to stick with the courts and the Supreme Court and talk a little bit about Abu Zubaydah. And uh, do you want to say something before that? I just wanted to talk about the Al Hilla thing briefly, right? Yes, um, please. Al, Al Hilla is a is the full appeals court making reviewing a decision on due process rights for Guantanamo detainees at Guantanamo who are not charged. Right. Um, and for me, it is an early opportunity to see if the Biden administration is going to try to, with some sophistication, articulate what has been sort of a pick and choose approach to, um, to rights at Guantanamo. You know, this is their opportunity. They can, they can articulate what they, you know, where they think due process fits in to this detention. They can ignore it and move on, you know, you know, be blind to it and move on with their plans to close. But, you know, they are going to the courts and we could learn a lot about how, what they're thinking about indefinite detention. Um, 
unless you believe that one day everybody's going to be gone from Guantanamo. So I think that, it, that, that it's an important po possible um, window into the thinking of the Biden administration. But I also th um, think that it will be an opportunity and it's a challenge, in fact, to the White House and the administration to articulate how much secrecy they think should take place with these proceedings in Guantanamo. You know, the court has been uh, reconstituted with a, a number of um, Trump appointees, including I think he's the youngest member of the court, Justin Walker, has said on multiple occasions that he does not believe that there is an absolute right to public access to the proceedings involving Guantanamo prisoners. And so, you know, it's been a secretive year or plus in the time of the pandemic. And um, this is an opportunity for the Biden administration to assert whether they think these things should be done with as much sunshine as possible, or it should be carried out in, in, in secrecy, which is consistent with the other part of the discussion, which is, the, you lower the attention to Guantanamo, um, you, you don't allow politics to intrude, maybe you can accomplish something, for example, through pleas and other sort of deals. But um, Alhela will be an opportunity for them to explain their attitudes towards a number of issues. Um, now the cynics among the lawyers think that they're just gonna continue sort of the same kind of view that that uh, actually Trump and Obama did of a pick and choose approach um, and um, an administrative approach or a bureaucratic approach. But, but I look forward to the filings in that case for that reason. And then you wanted to go on to Abu Zubaydah? As long as you're talking about secrecy and governments keeping things secret, I think we should turn to uh, Abu Zubaydah and talk about what's at stake in the case of, what, you know, of, of state secrets and I'll let you lay that out. And then Ben, I'm going to want to know your thoughts on this as well, because it's not really just about Abu Zubaydah, I don't think, or maybe you think it is. So let's, I'd love to know your thoughts. I think if Abu Zubaydah wins, it's not about Abu Zubaydah. Um, you know, the, 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 the very unsophisticated version of this is that um, his lawyers in, in pursuing a criminal case in Europe against uh, nations that supported the black sites um, have sought the identities of US agents and employees who worked in those black sites um, and have, and, and it will be up to the Supreme Court to decide whether national security secrecy and the intelligence apparatus um, trumps the rights so limited of detainees who were kept in the black sites. Um, should the court agree that a enough time has passed and that, there, that people's identities, and I believe it's nations, um, can be disclosed in a safe fashion, um, it will have great, I, I, I think, huge potential impact for all of the uh, CIA cases, the, the, the cases of black site prisoners. You know, one of the things that always seems to surprise people is that, you know, defense lawyers who have top secret security clearances at Guantanamo and um, you know, under threat of jailing if they mishandle classified information still are not entitled to know the names of some of the people who kept their American citizens, who kept their clients captive, even in a classified fashion. Um, so I think the potential for the Abu Zubaydah decision to have far reaching implications is great, but the real question is, does the national security aspect of the black site continue into How did I do, Ben? Over to you, Ben. <laughs> uh, wow, that's a uh, fraught. Um, uh, so, um, you know, obviously, or maybe not obviously, uh, the, the national security implications around the torture of my client and other men at Guantanamo um, have been uh, extremely extraordinarily, or the implication, implication of national security has been extraordinarily detrimental to our ability to investigate our case and uh, develop our defense and develop our case in mitigation. Um, all of these things are deeply problematic uh, from a fair trial and due process perspective, um, as well as from, you know, just a general like legitimacy perspective. Um, it, it is, you know, Carol's exactly right. 
but in fact, I would say she underplays it a little bit. Um, it, it's not just a few of the people who are involved in the detention and torture of my client and other men, you know, in the, er, the first half of the 2000s, um, whose identities we don't know. It's the vast majority of those people. Um, and it's the, you know, it, the names of the countries, the locations at which they were held, uh, and a lot of the, the details of what went on um, at those locations and what were uh, the things that were done to my client and others are um, remain hidden from uh, the defense as well as the rest of the public. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I run into very often is that um, people are surprised when I tell them that, you know, you or Carol or Brenner or any member of the audience can read the exact same amount of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence's report on the torture program that I, as a fully cleared, uh, you know, Department of Defense employee and defense attorney can read, right? Like I have no greater access to the findings of the SISI than, than do you. Um, and, you know, Carol mentioned that, that Alhella might be a, a good I think, I mean, she didn't use these words, but the way I see it is a, is a canary, uh, is a window into the Biden administration's thinking and about the sort of litigation positions they'll take. Uh, the Zabida case may well be a, a similar canary, um, but so would a decision about releasing the SISI report to defense attorneys. Um, you know, there, there is material evidence contained within the SISI report about what was done to my client that would be, you know, absolutely critical evidence uh, at his trial, if we were to go to trial and at his sentencing, were he to be convicted. Um, and, you know, if the, if the Biden administration made a decision to allow us to access that, that would be a really good signal that um, the president and the administration is committed to, you know, moving like progress towards an actual fair trial at Guantanamo. It's really interesting because it's both the accountability which Carol was talking about and the issue of actually a fair trial, which are actually two arguments that they may overlap, but they're two very legitimate um, different lanes to argue why this why these needs to be um, or could be public. Do you see any chance for the SISI report to ever be made possibly um, available to defense attorneys at, at Guantanamo? I, I really don't know. Uh, like I say, I, I think that it would be a very strong signal of a commitment to uh, due process and, and fair trial and a fair trial there. Um, it, it's essential that it be released to defense attorneys, um, you know, but obviously it's been you know, uh, almost seven years since the report was issued and we haven't had access to it yet. I wanna turn quickly before we get to questions and please feel free to put your questions in the Q and A. Um, uh, I want to just turn quickly to Congress because Biden has said, you know, he would like to do this with Congress. Uh, Carol, how do you see, what do you think that means? And do you really think Congress is, is, I get the feeling from you, you think Congress is necessary, do you? Carol. I'm thinking, um, <laughs> he hasn't seemed to need Congress for everything that's come until till now, but he has said that he, he, he has said that he believes he needs Congress. He did say that before he swept, you know, the Democratic Party swept the houses. Um, I, I don't, the answer is I don't know. I do believe that if he wants to bring detainees to the United States, he needs to have the prohibition removed from the, from the, from the defense policy bills and the bills that come that, um, there are people who will, there are lawyers who argue that he has commander in chief authority to, to, to move them and to ignore Congress. But, you know, we're ending the war in Afghanistan. He's declared, you know, he, he, he's, he's, he's getting further and further away from, in some regards, the commander in chief authority over these detainees. So, and, and I don't believe he believes he has the right to pick them up and bring them to the United States and even put them in military detention without the cooperation of Congress. So, so yes, the answer is he needs Congress. He needs to be able to get those prohibitions, I'm thinking it through, to get those prohibitions removed from the law. So yeah, he needs them. And he maybe understands that better than anyone. Ben, you agree? So I, I think it depends to some extent on what you mean by closed Guantanamo, right? Like it trains, I mean, if we're talking about transferring folks to the United States, detainees to the United States, um, 
I agree with Carol that President Biden has said that he needs Congress's help. I, you know, there are lawyers who would argue that Article Two provides him with sufficient authority to uh, to transfer detainees to the United States, irrespective of the transfer restrictions and the NDAA. Um, you know, one of those lawyers uh, was President Obama, um, who, in signing statements. Uh, raised concerns about the transfer uh, prohibition and suggested that he would ignore it uh, under the right circumstances. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's right, but um, I could, I mean, to the extent that the commander in chief authority is uh, informed by the laws of war, um, you know, you could construct an argument around, um, you know, the ending of an armed conflict and wind up authority, uh, you know, vesting the president with you know, necessarily vesting the president with the ability to um, resolve detention issues at the end of an armed conflict, whether it's releasing people um, or it's transferring people who have been um, uh, sentenced uh, to some facility within the United States to serve out the, the balance of their sentence um, that uh, was issued by a military tribunal. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not certain that he doesn't have uh, authority under Article Two to do this, although I, um, I, I'm, I also recognize that President Biden has said that he wants to work with Congress to get this done. There's so much that that's gone off kilter, both in terms of separation of powers, both in due process. It's hard to know where to begin in order to to get it closed, as you say, at so many levels. I want to start introducing some questions. One of them is from the first commander of Guantanamo Bay uh, Detention Facility, Michael General Michael Leonard, um, and he has a couple of questions, but I'm going to focus on the second one. As a hypothetical, suppose we release them and say 20 years is enough to Carol's point about transfer and not release. We have a military that has demonstrated the ability to find and neutralize that small number of detainees who have returned to the fight. Is keeping those remaining locked up worth continuing mortgaging our reputation to protect our security? And just as a tagline to that, let me add that one of the, the main reasons it's given to close it, and by Biden in 2005, by the way, as well as more recently, has been reputational um, the, the reputation of the United States uh, writ large around the world. So um, Ben, you wanna answer that and then we'll turn to Carol? No. <laughs> um, okay, Carol, you wanna answer that and then I'll have another one for Ben? <laughs> no, 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 I mean, the answer is, is no. Right? Like it's, <laughs> okay. it's absolutely not worth holding on to these folks. Um, yeah. And it's so interesting about the recidivism reports. I mean, I know that they're, you know, required out of the uh, intelligence community. I think it's like every six months. I'll be curious to see what the next one says about actual what we do know about recidivists and what we don't. Do you have any sense of that? So I think there was one released um, in February or March. Maybe? There was, but I think it was an old, you know, it was a an older one. So I'd yeah. like to see the newer. The yeah, newer. but I, they've been pretty stable for the last five years, right? Like the the re-engagement rate for folks who were released during the Obama administration remains like slightly less than 5% or just at around 5% for the confirmed re-engagement. And the suspected is slightly higher than that. And then both the confirmed and the suspected for the Bush administration are substantially higher. Um, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, but one of which, I mean, one of which is the stuff that we did in my previous job. And, and another factor is just the sheer passage of time and, and the, the age of uh, folks who've been locked up. Carol? So the, so the general's remarks illustrates the tension that's existed at Guantanamo almost since the beginning. The military officers have always been willing to suck it up and say, let someone go at the risk of them becoming, you know, behaving like the enemy again, and then we'll kill them. And the political people have always said, this is not a political risk that they're willing to take. I mean, I recall these conversations going on in 2002, where there would be people, let's say in the Southern Command who had made the decision that some people could be released, but they couldn't get it through Rumsfeld and the, and the administration. So, so that is the tension. Um, I should point out that there have been people who've been released for whom there are presumably, um, well, there's certainly, a, wanted, you know, there's bounties on their heads by the U.S. Department of, I think, States, uh, a witness of justice. I'm not getting the terminology right, but, you know, there's particularly one guy who they've put out a, a 
a yeah. reward if you can give his whereabouts. And he's been and he's been gone and on the lamb and, and presumed to be the enemy for quite some time. And we haven't captured or killed him. Um, I'm not I'm not suggesting that you know that's the ties up that package, but but the idea that if we send people to certain places and they turn out to behave in criminal behavior or as you know unorthodox warriors, we can get them is you know uh, the American military is great, the American intelligence is great but it's not absolute. And so it's the risk some of the military are willing to take and we're back to are the politicians. That's basically. It's interesting. There's kind of a follow-up question here from Joshua Draytel, who was the first lawyer to go to Guantanamo Bay a long time ago. Um, and um, his question is, what about the bureaucratic structures that exist, um, DOD, DOJ, CIA? Do you see them willing to sort of let this process happen? Or do you think that for reasons you've laid out, they might interfere? The answer is, I don't know. The answer is that this administration took over, you know, quite a while ago and has had a very, very slow start on articulating and developing a Guantanamo policy. And um, I encounter a number of people in my work who um, are not, who, who, are, who have the thinking of the last administration. Who, who are not really, who are, who are believe, how's this, who are believers in Guantanamo, opponents to release, and um, adopt the political point of view that, that Guantanamo detention is something that the American people appreciate, enjoy, are not troubled by, you pick the choice of it, and that why should this administration be staking out a new position? Um, it is unclear if those people are going to be told it's a new world, follow, are going to be excused, are going to, um, in time, be educated and adopt a new approach uh, to it in the same way as presumably they can educate some of the politicians. Um, we have, uh, this is like- Dead enders, you know, I don't know what the expression is, but people who believe in Guantanamo forever, they're, they're there, they're still in government and they're still, um, they're still in the military in certain areas and they're still working the story, the, um, the subject matter with an enthusiasm for the status quo. Okay. That's interesting. Now we have a question, speaking of the old days, also from Dan Mori, who was you know, another first lawyer uh, at Guantanamo. Um, and his question is, what would prohibit Biden bringing an Article III court to Gitmo to conduct trials and keep a small detention facility open for free trial and sentence detainees. Ben? Uh, I know so there are questions. <laughs> Fed courts was a long time ago for me. Um, uh, I, I suspect that like an act of Congress would be required, right? Like you'd have to create a judicial district that covered Guantanamo. Um, um, yeah, so I think that's what would prevent it. So, you know, it would be similar to, I mean, I guess it would be different because you wouldn't be bringing people to the United States, but you would need to get Congress involved um, in creating a temporary judicial district, which, you know, Congress has done before. Do you think that would expedite things? If Congress did it, do you think actually making the, instead of the military commissions or the same problems that you pointed to before about what it would take to bring these to Article Three courts would just be just as much of impediment as we've seen in the military commissions? So I, I think it would be, I, I think, so the, like the big problem with the military commissions, other than it was a, you know, judicial system created out of whole cloth um, and, you know, throwing out 250 years of precedent turns out to be sometimes a bad idea. Um, is the like the evidentiary problems surrounding the torture of my client and the other guys on trial, uh, right? So those evidentiary problems are going to follow the case to an Article Three tribunal, um, you know, just like they're present in the military commissions. So I'm not sure that that you know that would be um, a net benefit. Now, if you actually that said, right the Article three tribunals have had some experience with this, like, like the uh, Galani case had uh, in the Southern District dealt with the, the evidentiary issues uh, by, if I recall correctly, um, 
taking death off the table and uh, yes, and throwing out a bunch of the charges. Um, maybe, anyway, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't speak out of my hat. Um, so article three courts have experience dealing with those issues and they could come to some, you know, perhaps reasonable resolution and, you know, maybe actually get the case to trial. Um, you would presumably have problems with like selecting a jury pool um, with a, a, a tribunal established at Guantanamo as well. So I really, I mean, to my mind, the simplest course of action would be to work within the, the structures that currently exist to resolve the military commission's uh, uh, proceedings that are ongoing, the cases that are ongoing, uh, and that would be by playing them out. Um, for everything else, for you know, so that that you know that takes care of like twelve of the forty guys at Guantanamo. For the remaining twenty-eight, you know, establishing a new judicial district and and, and setting up a, a judge to oversee, you know, I mean, presumably they'd be handling habeas cases. But the only way that that would really benefit um, or expedite closure would be if the Justice Department stops, you know, taking aggressive litigation positions in habeas cases. Like I'm not sure that would solve the problem that the problems that have um, developed as a consequence of um, the litigation in habeas in the DC circuit, but you know, between 2008 and 2013. Just following up on that, Nick Lewin, who is a former um, uh, uh, assistant U.S. attorney uh, in the Southern District, has said, asked the question, which I think is interesting, which is, don't you think it would be much faster in the in the federal courts once they got them here? Isn't that I'm I'm paraphrasing, but based on other Article Three prosecutions, isn't it fair to say that even today these cases would proceed to trial faster um, in an Article Three court than in the commissions? Well, I'm not sure what faster than the commissions is, but I think it's a point well taken. Um, and the and the and the real issue here is evidentiary. You know exactly what ha would happen with speedy trial uh, motions. What would happen with um, the issues of of classified information? What would happen with issues that were uh, that were related to torture, tortured evidence, tortured witnesses. Do you think this would actually happen more quickly? And is it because of the Gailani case that was mentioned that you, you think that's possible or not? It's just too much of a quagmire. So, so yeah, I, I do think that, you know, if you were to bring folks to the United States um, and, and, you know, people were indicted here, those cases would move faster than, you know, the 9-11 case, which, you know, just entered its 10th year yesterday of pretrial proceedings. Um, but I, I think that there would be proof issues around convictions and sentencing. Carol, there's a bunch of questions about public sentiment. Um, and I want to ask you, sort of expanding on these questions, taking them a little larger, which is, has public sentiment changed over the years? Do you think that there that um, maybe there is more uh, determination to want to close it, that there's more sentiment about they don't care? <laughs> or do you think, um, and one of the questions asked, do you think that the Mauritanian, um, the uh, film about Mamadou um, al-Slahi um, has made a difference in the public consciousness? Just, uh, you've been watching this for so long. Is it the same, different? Where are we? I think there's been an evolution that's gone on for, you know, coming on 20 years where, um, at the beginning, there was very much a sense that it was our Guantanamo, America's Guantanamo. The military was carrying out the mission, but this was done for everybody. We were supposed to be getting the 9-11, um, you know, bin Laden, and et cetera. And there was a, a public ownership and appreciation for the detention operation at Guantanamo. I mean, people looked at orange men in orange jumpsuits and cages, and in some instances felt quite a lot of satisfaction about uh, seeing those men captured in the you know, awful months after 9-11. But I think what's happened, and I think it's, and I think that there's many reasons for it, is it's no longer America's Guantanamo. It's the Pentagon's prison, it's the Pentagon's court, it's some other thing, people don't have to think about it. It is true that, you know, there are rotations of guards from the National Guard um, across the country who go down there and serve tours, but I don't think that those soldiers um, are, are in a position and probably shouldn't be to think hard about the assignment. They go, they do it, they get scuba dive certified, they um, work their shifts, they go home, they, many of them have, I think they've signed non-disclosure agreements, and so the debate that could have come into the public through the soldiers just hasn't. Um, and 
the decisions by a number of people to isolate that place and not answer questions and uh, the secrecy surrounding so many things and frankly the lack of widespread coverage which is because it's hard and unpleasant to work at Guantanamo has the public has divorced themselves from the issue and ownership of it. So, so, um, and as for the film, it was a painful film to watch. It was a very painful film to watch. And so people who watch it are, are being expected to understand that this thing that was portrayed some time ago still exists. They've been told it's not like that anymore, that this was an extreme case. And so I guess I think that the film is mostly going to serve the purpose of preaching to the converted. I haven't really heard from someone who didn't think about Guantanamo before who watched the film and had a revelation. But you know, I have a, it's been COVID and I have a limited um, audience. The other thing I wanted to mention was the idea about federal court, a federal court down there. Yeah, apparently you need to have an act of um, Congress. Congress, Colonel Morey. But in addition, um, I think that the concept for many is that it would be sort of a guilty plea bill, that the federal courts would be more pragmatic and you could have that either up here or down there where a federal judge would be much more pragmatic about the limitations and, and, and invocations of national security would look at the possibility for a fair trial and would make the decision to provide remedies. And one of the remedies you know, that everybody on the defense is looking for is taking death off the table. And once you take death off the table, you get closer to potential guilty pleas for, by some of these people. In addition to which, I know that the federal court uh, guilty plea mill solution has been advanced by people who aren't charged because as we, those of us who follow Gitmo remember that um, they started off by wanting to charge foot soldiers uh, with providing material support for terror and that charge became unavailable at a military commission. But there has been some theory that some of the men down there who've never been charged with a war crime could somehow uh, get converted into federal cases and plead guilty to providing material support for terror, which um, you know is pretty much punishable by 20 years in prison. And some of those detainees arrived there in 2002. Um, so I, but I'd also like to point out Guantanamo is a terrible place to have court. It doesn't matter whether it's a federal court or a military commissions court. A Navy captain decides whether people arriving are put into two weeks of quarantine because of the potential for spreading um, the pandemic. There's a constant struggle between the townies who live on the base and the people who come down to you know, do justice over where they can stay, where they can go. You know, they're building, they're, they're building, they're, They've torn down tents, they're building new tents. It's not like this is putting people on trial in, a, in an urban center where all the lawyers and the judge can you know, appear, move there and uh, stay in a hotel and go, and go to work and go home on the weekend. It's, it's remote, it's uncomfortable, it's unpleasant and it's not meant for any kind of intensive um, federal court process. Military judges are willing to put up with that. Military prosecutors kind of enjoy the idea of expeditionary justice. It allows for certain kinds of you know, behaviors in terms of they are the go-between with the prison. I mean, there's all sorts of things that work for military commissions that I think would be unacceptable to federal prosecutors and unacceptable to federal judges. They would say, you know, what kind of justice is this? Well, they've had a long time to say it. Um, ben, uh, Carol mentioned the judges, she mentioned the prosecutors. From the defense attorney's um, um, perspective, the logistics, forgetting the other issues that you've already talked about, are the logistics, how are the logistics um, uh, uh, impeding what you wanna do in terms of just what Carol's mentioned, but also a number of, of, um, of questioners have asked, what do you expect to change? Things stay the way they are with the military commissions. What do you expect to change procedurally? And I want to change that a little bit and say, what would you recommend would change just on the practical level of whether it's attorney client meetings, whether it's other um, aspects of the courtroom? What, what would you suggest and what do you see coming? Well, that's a big question. Um, 
So, and, and actually, before I get to it, I just want to go back to the, the federal court issue um, and the Gilani case. And I, I just want to say that there, that Gilani is going to be an imperfect model for any future federal court proceeding, in part because we know so much more about the torture program than we did in 2009, 2010. And one of the things that we know is that uh, it was uh, it was not just the CIA's program, right? And that um, and that the you know the the evidentiary cures um, that were developed by the Bush administration uh, uh, failed. Um, and that there's in, like the so-called clean teams were inherently tainted by the torture program. Um, so the like the I don't think the Gilani tribunal or trial had to grapple with those issues um, because they were not you know aware to uh, of them in the way that we are now. And that information has been developed by litigation primarily in the 9/11 case over the last you know four or five years. Um, you know. The logistics of going to Guantanamo are crazy. Um, you know, for people who do, don't know, the only, the basically the only people who are involved in the trial or the proceedings down there, uh, who actually live at Guantanamo, are the defendants, the prosecutors, their staff, the defense attorneys, their staff, the judge, his his or her staff, um, the media like Carol, the victim family members, the NGO observers. We all assemble at uh, Andrews Air Force Base and we get on a flight and we fly about four hours down to Guantanamo and uh, the plane disgorges us and we're there for you know a week or two or three or however long the hearing is supposed to last. Um, and, uh, and if the hearing comes to an end abruptly for you know a variety of reasons like an impending hurricane or the judges uh, uh, retina detaches, uh, we are still likely going to be stuck there unable to do work for the duration of the of, of whatever the hearing was supposed to be. Um, it, so it's a wildly expensive and time consuming thing to do to go and have hearings uh, in, that are, you know, merely incremental and pretrial. Um, but, you know, much worse than the logistical hurdles faced by defense attorneys and other participants in the case are the, the sort of conditions in which our clients live and operate and engage with um, their uh, attorneys. Um, you know, Camp Seven, where they were housed since September of two, or since the September of two thousand six, was literally falling apart, and there were periodically there'd be like sewage backing up in the cells and. Um, and the doors, you know, wouldn't really close. And there were all sorts of problems with Camp 7. And so in the face of a crumbling and decrepit Camp 7, they've recently moved um, my client and others to Camp 5, which had been a low value detainee facility, um, you know, during the Obama administration. And that move has been, you know, has improved, right? Like we've gotten away from the crumbling infrastructure of Camp 7, but Camp 5 is not a panacea. And there are like it appears that the move had not been well thought out or planned. And there are just all sorts of um, hurdles in terms of hygiene and in terms of um, food and food prepar preparation and the, the sort of necessaries of, uh, of keeping good care and custody of detainees at Guantanamo, at least my client and men like him, um, that are now injected in this process. And all those things create substantial obstacles to moving towards trial. Like they, they impact the attorney client relationship. They impact our ability to work with our client um, to prepare for trial. And then, you know, that's all on top of the fact that we haven't seen him for 14 months um, since, you know, February of 2020. Uh, so many of these things would not be issues if, you know, you know, 20 years ago, this terrible decision to offshore um, supposed law of war detainees at Guantanamo Bay had not been made. Um, it's interesting, we use the phrase outside the law, but it's outside, not just the law, it's outside the norms, it's outside so many customs that have grown up, it's outside, you know, in some ways decency and, you know, it's outside so many things when I hear outside the law, it just, it's a little bit too contained listening to the two of you. Um, we're, we're sort of out of time. So I want to just ask one thing of, of each of you before we go, we've had tons of questions and um, which is, which tells you how interested people are in this. Um, but my one question is, um, if there was one thing you could see the Biden administration do and do quickly, 
to sort of start to move uh, the process along for closing Guantanamo in its various chapters that it has to be closed, what would it be? Carol, you want to go first? This is not about closing Guantanamo, but I have to say that I'm extremely surprised that it appears to me that the administration has yet to meaningfully open up the files of um, some of two of the men who had semi-finished arrangements for relocate, cleared men who had semi-finished relo uh, arrangements for relocation to their um, home countries, possibly to pr prison there. I'm not saying they were gonna be set free in their countries. And that, it, you know, as, mu as hard as I try, I cannot find evidence that they are like, have renewed that effort to get those two men out of there. I think that they're taking a broader view of, of how transfers will look and, um, it is possible that they just don't want to do onesies and twosies for the political reasons of it, but the playbook was written in the Obama administration and it's not clear to me that they're following it. Back to Ben's original point. Ben, what about you? What would you like to see happen that's not happened yet? Well, so I, I'm not sure that it hasn't happened yet, but the, the one thing that I, that I would want to see the, the Biden administration do um, is to have somebody at the White House at a relatively senior level, you know, probably on in the NSC staff, um, be the point person for Guantanamo closure to drive the policy forward. I think, you know, uh, my hope is that President Biden learned this lesson from the Obama administration, but one of the pitfalls of the Obama administration was not having consistent White House engagement on Guantanamo closure throughout the Obama administration. Um, and this is an issue that uh, really requires um, White House engagement in order to get the, the gears of the bureaucracy, whether it's state or DOD or justice or the intelligence community to work together towards you know, transferring, uh, transferring detainees and closing the facility. So the real question is, are we gonna be back here a year from now having the same conversation. And um, I'm hoping that with all the ideas that are out there and all of the intentionality that's been expressed, um, they'll, we won't be having the same conversation, which is can Guantanamo close? So I wanna thank Brenner Fissell um, and the National Institute of Military Justice for hosting this panel. I wanna thank Ben Farley, it's so nice to see you. I wanna thank Carol Rosenberg um, for continuing this conversation for all of us for so long. Um, you can find uh, Ben and you can find Carol on various uh, places. Carol, of course, in the New York Times, both of them in the CNS Safan Group Morning Brief whenever they write. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all next time on whatever we talk about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.